Good morning. Good morning. A warm welcome is extended to all, and I mean that both literally and physically. <laughs> welcome to St. Luke's United Church on another warm, humid day in Cambridge, Ontario. Nice to see some faces back. Welcome back, Jenny, Barb, John, and we also have Beth Evans from Wesley. Welcome. And for those of you who are unable to join us in person, we thank you for worshiping with us on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you to Andrew for making all that possible. Marion is finally moving back into her home after a long extended period of time. So we wish her well and keep her in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you to Daria for playing this morning and to the choir for their gift of music, Mary for advancing the slides, and George and Sharon for preparing the refreshments after church. Please stay if you are able. Our gathered presence enriches our faith lives and our time of worship. God gives us this space as a gift. We have a few announcements. As uh, many of you have heard, we have invested in a new digital sign. We want to keep up with the times and um, let everyone know that St. Luke's Church is alive and vibrant and well. So we invite you to be part of this exciting time. And if you would like to make a donation for the sign, please do so by either e-transfer or a check, just indicating that it is for the new digital sign. Thank you. Now, it's been pretty hot out there these past few days, weeks actually. So why uh, cook in the kitchen? Get out of the kitchen and come on down to Truck and Tuesdays um, and have a delicious meal there, enjoying some community and some fun between 4.30 and 7.30. There's lots of activity on the line. This week, we trucks will be Berlin 95, full cheesy, crystal fries, and born to eat. So we hope to see many of you out there. An important reminder, there will not be church for the next four weeks in person or online. Uh, we're having a wee bit of break, but we encourage you to visit other churches. And we will see you all back on August 18th, so we wish you well. Stay healthy, stay health, stay healthy. I'm, I'm just going to add a quick one. Sorry, Mary. Um, the food bank, however, we will not be here. I'm sorry, I didn't put that out there. But I do know the food bank is in great need once again, um, especially now because the children are not at school, so they're not getting their breakfast that they often get through the school system or through um, organizations. So if you would like to, you can bring it on Tuesday evenings, we'll still have that, or when we resume back on the uh, 18th of August. That would be wonderful, so thank you for that. Today, we welcome back Michelle Branoff to lead us in worship. We hope you are enjoying the summer and are grateful to have you with us this Sunday morning. So, welcome. We look forward to your reflection. Thanks, Joni. I always get a warm welcome here, and it's good to come back. It's especially lovely this Sunday as I have some friends from Wesley here and it's like when, when old friends either meet each other or you know they already know each other, it's always a special moment. So, uh, so yeah, enjoying. We'll begin with the territorial acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the Haldeman track and that we are a treaty people. And let's think of the indigenous practice of looking to the four directions. If I was doing this really well, I'd face north, but I get confused, so. <laughs> you, you can think of which way this is north. Hmm? Oh, I am facing north, thank you. 
Yes, yes. So in addition to being told which way is north, I was told about the four directions um, by an indigenous elder. So he would studied traditional indigenous medicine practice as a medicine man and was a candidate for ministry in the United Church. And he said to me that the four directions invite the wisdom of the people of the east, the color yellow, the people of the west, red, the people of the south, black, and also white. So this is not always the way the colors are arranged. I found that out on one occasion. Much like settler people, indigenous folks have different perspectives on many things. But this Sunday, let us pray with the colors of the four directions, yellow, red, black, and white. And now we'll light the Christ candle. Thank you, Joni. As we light the Christ candle, we honor the tradition of our territory and our obligation as treaty people to share responsibility for feeding and healing a planet and people and to be allies for ecosystems and for peace. Let us pray together. The call to worship is responsive and it's based on the prophet by Cahill Gibran on prayer. We pray in our distress and in our need, would that we might also pray in the fullness of our joy in our days of abundance. Darkness into space is also for our delight to pour forth the dawning of our hearts. No one can teach us how to pray in words. God listens not to our words, but us there's a prayer through our lips. No one can teach us the prayer of the seas, the forests, and the mountains. But we who are born of the mountains and the forests and the seas can find their prayer in our hearts. And if we listen in the stillness of the night or the brightness of the day, we shall hear this prayer arising from the stillness. Our God, who is our winged self, it is your will in us becomes our will. It is your desire in us that inspires our desire. It is your urge in us that would turn our nights, which are yours, into days, which are yours also. We ask you for anything, for our needs before they are born, us. We are what we need in giving us self. You give us everything. Amen. And uh, the opening hymn, Voices United 242, the words will be on the screen. Let all things now living.
The opening prayer is from 2 Samuel, verses, chapter 6, verses uh, 1 to 5 and 12b to 19. After the defeat of the Philistines, David gathered the chosen men of Israel. There were 30,000. David set out with all the people to bring home the Ark of God. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before God with all their might with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. David brought up the Ark of God to the city of David with rejoicing. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the Ark of God with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Delighted, let us dance all day long. Knowing God, we will never keep quiet about God's love. Vibrant beauty of God is within us. God has been so good for us. It is, if, it is as if we are walking on air. All we have and have we owe to God. Amen. Amen. I, that was actually an accident, but we can say amen twice for Thanksgiving. And now we're going to sing our praise. Voices United 245. Praise the Lord with the sound of trumpet. And now it's the time when we uh, look to the people around us, we nod, smile, nudge elbows. Maybe we don't need to nudge elbows so much. Maybe we can even hug. But now is the time to share the peace of Christ. God's peace be with you. be with you. God bless. Uh, happy summer. We'll see you in four weeks and uh, nice to see you all here in person and online of course. God bless. See you in a month. And, uh, the next song is in uh, preparation setting the scene for the scene for the gospel. Voices United 10 uh, prepare the way of the Lord.
on this side. Prepare the way of, prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make a straight path for him. Make a straight path. Prepare. Let us pray. May God's light shine upon us to bless my voice as I read the gospel and to bless our hearts and minds as we contemplate the words of scripture. Amen. Our scripture reading is taken from the gospel of Mark, chapter 16, 14 to 29, the death of John the Baptist. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead? For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So, so Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came on his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath. Whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once, the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought him back, his head, on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Here ends the reading. Thanks be 
to God. Dictionary gave us this story. And uh, my inclination when there's something I don't like is to change the readings, but uh, I was in seminary about 20 years ago and I decided I would follow the lectionary. It's very practical. I come to St. Luke's and you've got other people doing pulpit supply and I follow a certain order and it's less likely to be repetitive. But it's also a challenge how to uh, turn back to a scripture that wants me to skip it and forget it and not read it. A particularly challenging reading today, particularly challenging for us this morning when we either heard last night or woke up to news of, of a, an assassination attempt uh, south of the border. Um, very dark, dark times. So here we are with this dark story. Um, I don't even read dark novels in February, but maybe July, there's lots of daylight, we're ready. The, um, the first prayer is, is based on a story from Samuel, the celebration of the return of the ark to Jerusalem. And the people with David were dancing their prayers with so much joy. It's not in the part that we prayed today, but later on, if you continue reading in Samuel, we are introduced to Michaela, the daughter of Saul, Saul was the former leader, and we hear that Michaela turned her way, turned away from the dancing, despising David in her hearts. And then there's a conversation between Michaela and David, um, and she was very critical. She said, "Here you're dancing half naked in the streets," and she criticized his relationship to the slave girls. And he, he had a response. Um, we know David had his weaknesses. Um, especially around women. So maybe what she said had some truth, but there was also this rivalry between the families. Now that particularly story set, ends with the words. There is no indication of who won the, the verbal battle, but it ends with the words that Michaela died and never had children, seen at the time as a, as a punishment from God. Now, that would be a really good topic for a feminist Bible study. It's dark enough, difficult enough today, so I'm going to leave that for another time. But the other part of that message is God did the battle. David didn't need to. And there are many stories in scripture where God solves battles in interpersonal and on a large scale. But what about now? If we, if we wait for God to answer our prayers or solve our battles, uh, we may stay in the shadow. So what do the rest of us do when we are facing a shadow, a toxic relationship, or maybe, maybe an annoying or irritating, hurtful pattern or incident in our family or with our neighbors or someone we love. The gospel story is where it gets really dark. State-sanctioned mur murder, a beheading. And it, it wasn't even purporting to be after a trial. And interesting enough, the, the women, Herodias and her daughter, are the villains. So no typecasting. There are some wonderful heroes who are women in the Bible stories, but also villains like today. And we see Herodias and her daughter, how clever they are, how cunning. Herod is tricked because he gave his word in public and at a personal level and as a royal uh, appointment, He's got a, a challenge. He appreciated and feared John. He, he was challenged by him, but he saw himself as trapped, that he had what he saw as no choice. 
And many of us are faced big and small with a moral dilemma. We see ourselves as people of honor. Would we lie or break a promise in order not to commit a crime, do something unethical, order a murder? Well, I'd like to think I would choose the right thing. But the reality is that, you know, sometimes it's a question, do we follow the policies or the rules when they are unjust? Or do we do something for justice? And you know, the thing is, it's really simple and straightforward when you read it in history or in the scripture. It's even so obvious in hindsight. I know, I've looked that way and, and seen how obvious it can be. Or if it's someone else's moral dilemma, it's much easier to see what they should have done. And it's, uh, there's a little colloquial expression about painting yourself into a corner. Uh, the way I've experienced is on the rare occasion when I clean the floor, sometimes I don't leave the way out of the room open without walking across the newly cleaned floor. Um, so, so Herod has painted himself into a corner. He's there in the shadows because he perhaps didn't realize he had a choice or didn't figure out what to do. And we also find ourselves in shadows. Maybe it's confronting the shadow side of ourselves or a toxic relationship, toxic organization or system where the rules are unjust. Maybe it's being a world citizen in an era of polarized politics. Now David, who was dancing his prayer, dancing with joy as if no one was watching, of course was being watched by a very critical person, and he had a conversation. These days we call them a difficult conversation or a courageous conversation. Difficult because it's really hard to do, courageous because we'd rather not and we're scared and we boldly do it anyway. It's a conversation where if you don't talk about it, it, it'll always be there haunting you in the shadows, in the background. But if that conversation that is so delicate goes the wrong way, the relationship could end, be destroyed. And so sometimes we have courageous conversations because the relationship is so important and we're willing and confident and trust the person, have confidence in ourselves, we're gonna go deep and have a bold and courageous conversation. And sometimes we just let that relationship stay very, very superficial or maybe end because we don't want to be that bold or courageous. But the thing is about these conversations, it gets things out in the open. And of course, the conversation between David and Michalah was so much in the open that it became part of sacred scriptures. An example of facing the shadows for the rest of us. Now, Herod, Herod didn't have a conversation. He saw himself as having no choice, and maybe we would think of Herod when we talk about the path to hell being paved with good intentions. He didn't pray his way out. He didn't pray to be calm or for inspiration from God. He didn't pray as a way of meditating on a strategy or this dilemma. But the thing is, who we are and what we do is not just based on our intentions. You know, sometimes it matters if we didn't mean to do it. Um, there are very serious crimes like murder and attempted murder where a lack of intention means it's not as serious a crime. But if it's an accident or negligent, not meaning to do it still leaves us responsible. And of course, in relationships, whether it's an employment relationship or a family relationship or a neighborhood 
or a relationship with someone you care about, just because we didn't mean to do it, doesn't mean it doesn't throw a shadow over that relationship. And I really needed this inspiration this week because um, I had a conversation with my mother. She's 90 and it's quite exhausting as she has uh, my dad's in assisted care, a little bit of dementia, Parkinson's, nine falls in eight weeks, and there are challenges. So my conversation with mom was actually not about her caregiving role or burnout, and sometimes it is, but it was about her neighbor, her good friend, I'll call her Maisie. Now Maisie can be really, really helpful, but sometimes Maisie can be a bit of a bully. And my mother's 90 years old, which means when a younger person bullies her, maybe it's elder abuse. And that's why I listen and talk to my mother, because I'm very, very aware. She tells me about what's going on. I say, that's elder abuse. She says, I'm strong. I can handle it. Until next time. And this particular incident, Maisie said to her afterwards, you got too loud. You should be quieter on the phone. Don't get so loud. And my mother repeated this and was second-guessing herself. Yeah, you know, I, if I tell you that my mother's voice goes high and she talks with her hands, <laughs> maybe you'll recognize. Um, so she's second-guessing herself. And I'm, you know what, Mom? It's a boundary issue because that's what it was. Maisie was overstepping. I said, that's what bullies do. They tell you not to do whatever responsive behavior, protective behavior you do, bullies criticize it. Now the thing that's important for me to keep in mind, and maybe something for you guys to think about, is there's a big difference between listening and responding in family and friendship than back in the day when I was a counselor. So I, I used to do uh, mental health counseling. And the thing about being a counselor is they pay you to have courageous conversations, to ask difficult questions, to push against their idea that they have no choices and there is no dilemma, and let them respond. But as family and friends, especially as a daughter, you've got the relationship to think about. Like it's one thing if your client fires you, they'll go to another counselor who will tell them the same thing. Eventually they will or will not figure it out. But with family, not counseling. So listening. But I have to curtail how much I challenge because of my relationship with my mother, but also because this neighbor is someone that my mother has known her whole life. It's a valuable relationship. My relationship with Maisie, I let it go very superficial, but that's not my mom's choice. So basically, I'm shining a little bit of light into the shadows. And on this occasion, it was validating my mother's response. I said, when Maisie says you're too loud, I say, get louder. I think Michelle Obama would say take the high road, but I just said take, go louder. And, and it strengthens the resolve. So the interesting thing that I've noticed in the last two or three years, as my mother's life has grown more and more challenging, when I was young, she always told the story of her life about the wonderful days when her dad was alive, the shadow of his sickness between when he was 10 and 16, and all of the hardship that victimized her until she met my dad and got married and life was wonderful. I think it might be a classic story for a woman who came of age in the 1950s. Life was tough and men are there like Prince Charming. But that's not the story she tells now. The story she tells now is I'm strong. I've done this and this and this and I survived and I'm strong. So she didn't want help for me to talk to Macy. She was strong, she could do it herself, and she felt okay about getting loud. So what 
do we do when it's us? I didn't tell my mother what to do other than get loud, but what do we do when it's ourselves, when it's our shadow, our organization that is toxic or dangerous? What do we do when we're irritated and we need to have a courageous conversation, but we don't really know what to say? And I think Jesus gave us a little bit of an answer to that. Basically, to be as cunning as Herodias and her daughter. There's a story in the Beatitudes where someone asks Jesus what to do if, if, if someone hits you across the face. And Jesus says, turn the other cheek. And I think the bullies out there say, that means back down, do nothing. Kind of like Maisie, you're getting too loud. But there's a social justice interpretation of turning the other cheek, that it's peaceful resistance, that in that day and that time, they must have slapped each other a lot to have a uh, protocol about how you slap people. It was also hierarchical. So there's, there's one way that a right-handed person would slap a person on the right cheek, backhanded, or they would slap with the palm of their hand on the left cheek. And the thing is, the right cheek or the left cheek, I get my, in addition to right directions, I have trouble left and right. So we'll leave that behind me. That's one of my shadows. And uh, the way it works is if you turn the other cheek, no matter which way, if you're the slave or you're the equal, it's a peaceful resistance. Because if you're an equal and someone slaps you and you turn the other cheek, you're basically saying, oh, are you going to treat me like a slave? Because I'm not going to fight you. If you're a slave and you turn the other cheek, you're like, you hit me again. We're equals. I can do whatever I want. Very, very cunning and clever. Not in the immoral way of Herodias and her daughter, but in the way of Jesus and peaceful resistance. So. We can pray, not just when we're dancing our prayer, but when we're figuring out our dilemma. And here's a couple of things to keep in mind. Those shadows, you know, it's not just black or white. There is a continuum. So there are people, and I'm one of them, who, who may overthink things a lot. John's not even nodding his head. How sweet of him. And there are people who are totally not self-aware at all. They don't overthink, they don't think. And most of us are somewhere in the middle. There are people who, when faced with conflict, will confront in a, collabor in a comp competitive, aggressive way, and there's people who avoid conflict. They're like, down, gone. There are people who are often very, very, very directive, and maybe they're a bully. And then there are people who can be pushed over. And sometimes it changes in the context. Some people have a certain style for conflict, a certain com communication style. And the thing is, trying to figure out where we are on the continuum is a good thing to prey on. It's also an interesting way to open a conversation. When I was a mediator, if one person said, you're too bossy to our daughter, I did family mediations, usually divorcing couples or divorce, and the other person says, oh, you're just a pushover, you do whatever she says, they're going to argue and they're accusing one another. I have ever, ever had any, any disagreement if I said to someone, who's most inclined to be late? Well, they would agree. Who's most inclined to be really early? They agreed. Even the couple who we actually set the mediation time a half hour before it really was, so one of them would be on time. And the other one was still early. But they could agree on that, not whether someone was too early or too late. So when we're praying, whether dancing or in our, our dilemmas, when we're praying, for our shadows, let's also pray those four directions because it's not just about geography, thank goodness, 
um, because I, I need all the help I can get, but also respecting diversity. Because the thing is, as they say, our thoughts, we need to be careful because they become our deeds and then our habits, and that's our character. And that's how we paint ourselves into corners or are ready for courageous conversations. Now, I had this whole sermon already, and then the news came on this morning. Actually, John told me the news, and then I listened to it. But. And so I, I just added a little comment. Um, when, um, when I was in management at uh, a nonprofit organization for mental health, we had a lot of training by a, a fellow by the name of DeVries, and I forgot his first name, and he developed what he called a protocol for threat risk assessment, and, and I got some certification. And what the idea of a threat risk assessment is we all take care of each other. If you see something, you tell someone and an organization like a school or a workplace designates who you tell. You know? And the idea is we figure out a baseline behavior. Whatever someone usually does, and if they deviate in a negative way from the baseline behavior, we tell someone we respond. And in schools, that's usually one of those big meetings where they bring in um, the, uh, the, the counselors, the family, the school staff involved, and in a great many cases, and you wouldn't know because it's confidential, they bring in the probation officer and they, and they have a meeting. So the thing about the threat risk assessment is we have this idea of what the person usually does. Um, if they usually pick fights, a little boy picks fights with kids his own age, and he starts picking fights with the kids in kindergarten who are smaller, that, that's, that's something to pay attention. And, 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 and we can, we can de-escalate a situation that could be violent by helping a person before they buy the guns or start making the bombs. And, and on, on one occasion, the trainer, uh, Mr. DeVries, and I forgot his name, but I remembered he was Dutch, um, he, he told us a story about a young man who was very volatile, would immediately pick fights, push people over, um, very aggressive, very violent. And on a particular occasion, he, um, he was talking to the principal and he goes, I could burn this school down, I could burn this school down, I could burn this school down, you're lucky I'm not gonna do it. And the principal was quite frightened, he consulted Mr. DeVries, who said, hey, his baseline behavior is to do something and we've been telling him to use his words. He's using his words, it's good. I mean, it's not like they didn't keep an eye on him. But, but another strategy at, at a, a, a level is what is the baseline behavior? Maisie always pushes a little bit. If she starts pushing more, we need to do something. So the Bible characters give us role models, give us villains, and, and, and sometimes they're men and sometimes they're women. But it also has some hints about accountability, apologies, making amends, ways to confront our shadow in ourself and in others. Jesus told us about turning the other cheek, a very cheeky way to resist. And so let us pray that in relationships, we turn to prayer, we turn to peaceful resistance. And maybe you'll be like my mom and stay in a relationship and have courageous conversations or maybe you'll be like me and keep that relationship su superficial and at a distance. But we need to pray on what a healthy relationship is, whether it's at home or at work. It's a little bit like a basement or an attic in the summer of an old house. You got to run the dehumidifier, and maybe you got to make sure there aren't any bats or other creatures in that hot attic. You got to check. There's a poem by Rumi where he talks about dancing with the skeletons in your closet, knowing them. Thomas King, in a, in a new novel that I just read, it's called Indian Vacation. He can say it, he's indigenous, and he's got two main characters, uh, Mimi and Bird. And Mimi has named what she calls Bird's 
demons. Clearly, Bird has some mental health issues because the, the, the demons are um, catastrophizing, that's Kitty, um, uh, self-loathing, that's Leroy, um, the twins that are Ms. and Ms. who are depression and misery, and, and, and the list goes on. And of course, Thomas King, it's quite hilarious because these demons in the background are doing all kinds of things. But, but they are part of our shadows. If we can dance with the shadows, our skeletons, if we can name the shadows in bold conversations, then we're along the way of what Jesus has taught us. And if we can't, we can pray on it. Let it be so.
And now it's time for our offering, and when we get to it, the offertory music is Voices United 540, grant us God the grace of giving. We pray that our gifts today will be amplified by the grace of God as Jesus turned water into wine and multiplied the loaves and fishes. We pray that what we give will make a difference and that through this offering today, we will continue to give, whether gifts of time, money, listening, relationships. We pray with hearts, minds, and hands and raise our voices to sing with joy. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we pray for the ill, the injured, the weary, the anxious, the depressed, and for lonely people. We pray that they find comfort and healing. We pray for the oppressed, the bullied, and the vulnerable that they find allies and strategies for peaceful resistance. We pray for oppressors, bullies, and dictators. May they see themselves as their targets see them. Find some level of self-awareness, enlightenment, feel remorse, seek atonement, and a new way. Today, we pray for world leaders and celebrities, especially in the U.S. presidential race, but also elsewhere. We pray first for safety. We pray that the people entrusted with safeguarding those who are vulnerable will move into proactive responses to violence. We pray that there will be more discussion about guns and compromises about how people obtain them. And we pray that new strategies and resources, like the threat risk assessment, which is a protocol to avoid shooting and mass violence, we pray that those kind of strategies will be talked about among neighbors and friends and families and in political and other organizations that we have courageous conversations about how to be peaceful and loving together. And we pray that leaders, especially in politics, will seek to confront not so much each other as the polarization between them, that they focus on the problems, not the personalities. We pray that we stop with the language of attack in order to set in place a culture for conflict de-escalating and non-violent resolution. And we pray for the planet and the people. May we find a way to collaborate and be creative before the climate crisis and violence totally overwhelm us and paralyze us. We pray in the words that Jesus taught us.
closing hymn is Voices United, 884, You Shall Go and Jump. respond always with peace and love. Let us go out with joy. <laughs> 